Dear guests, we are proud to have an exceptional speaker with us today, Professor Katie Clark from Duke University. The Fuka School of Business will de deliver a speech titled How Can Impact Management Unlock Sustainable Development? With her extensive expertise and knowledge in this field, she will enlighten us and serve, us, serve as a source of inspiration. We warmly welcome Professor Katie Clark and thank her for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here, thanks to TED University, um, the, uh, the other hosts of this event, um, including Shafak and her team. Um, and I'm just so incredibly honored and delighted to uh, be part of how Turkey starts to act in these areas going forward. And what we can learn together today um, is going to be so inspiring for me. Um, I was asked to talk about how impact management can unlock sustainable development, and I want to kind of go back, and I'm going to use a, you know, I'm going to use my teaching skills and, and use a very simple analogy. So forgive me if it seems overly simple, but I want you to remember it. Um, we all know, and this other speakers have talked about, you know, we've struggled to um, understand the impact of our actions on other people on the planet for a very long time. It's complicated. Um, we heard already this morning about the distinction in how it might be a little bit easier to, member, to measure and act on environmental impacts than it is on social ones. Um, we heard about how important it is to think about how are you measuring and how are you understanding your, your, your impact on youth. We all know we want to make people's lives better. We want to make sure the planet sustains life going forward. Um, we want to take care of people after national disasters like earthquakes. And we want to be sure the next generation is better off than we are. So why is this so hard? And as you're thinking about that, I'm going to share my oversimplistic analogy, uh, which is I think we need three things to do this well. We need a roadmap, we need vehicles, and we need fuel. I was gonna say gas, but now I'm gonna say fuel instead to recognize that that fuel could be a different kind of power or energy that, that needs to drive us. In terms of the roadmap, we have the sustainable development goals. And it is truly amazing that over 190 governments have agreed to adopt and work towards reaching these goals. That is an incredible roadmap. And you already heard this morning, universities can adopt them. Private sector institutions can adopt them. Investors have adopted them. So we have our roadmap, we have our global to-do list sitting in front of us. And what we've seen recently is that the, the existence of this roadmap has allowed the public sector and private sector to come together in new ways to start to figure out what the vehicles are that work for both. On the investor side, I spend a lot of time working with investors and in particular impact investors. We know that 70% of investors use the SDGs to orient their goals. 70%, that's a very large number. That's very exciting. What do investors invest in? Usually they invest in companies. So let's look at how well companies are doing. On the enterprise side, we know that in 2019, while 72% of companies mentioned the SDGs in their reporting, okay, that sounds good, we know that only 14% of those mention specific targets. Only 1% actually track their influence and change on those targets. So we have a gap. We have a roadmap, but our vehicles and actions are not aligning. And that's where we are. So I want to ask you, how likely is it that someone's going to achieve a specific goal if they don't measure their progress? Would you invest in a company that said, no, we don't have income statements. We don't have balance sheets. Just trust us. We'll make you money. Would you trust your sister if she said, I'm going to lose weight, but I'm never going to weigh myself? You wouldn't. I can tell you from my own personal experience of trying to lose weight, if I don't measure myself and actually track the different things that I'm trying and seeing if they're working, I gain weight. <laughs> it goes the other way because I'm not learning what works and I'm not figuring out what to get better. And this is what we mean 
by impact measurement and management. Being clear about the change you're trying to, to, to create for a person or for a natural resource, and then creating a system of learning that allows you to achieve that goal. It's as simple as that. It is not rocket science, but you have to actually put it into place. So we have the roadmap, we have the SDGs, we have the vehicles of different sectors working together. Where are we on the fuel? And what I think we've learned, and I see it across every major sustainability impact standard around the world, is that the fuel are the practices and the system that you put into place to make sure you're continuously learning. They're easy to follow, they're pretty simple, and they're in essence the, 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 the steps of impact management. And there are four of them. You're gonna hear about this um, later in the workshop today. If you stay for that, we're gonna go into them in more detail, but they're very simple. The first one is setting your strategy, deciding which SDGs you want to address, which issues are the biggest pain and potential points for your stakeholders, and agreeing on what goals your organization will pursue over what time frame. This sets up your accountability framework. You can measure, but if you don't have this framework set up of what you're trying to achieve, you will not know how to adjust. Second is integrating that strategy and how you implement and what you actually do differently. It's a little bit like the difference between a CEO making a net zero pledge and all the people in that organization trying to figure out what to do about it, <laughs> right? Um, there's a case that I brought into my class recently. It was a grocery, ch grocery store chain, and the CEO had, had made this net zero pledge. In the next 10 years, we're gonna reduce our carbon emissions to zero. And the people in the, in the grocery stores were going, but we have to make sure the food is cold. How are we ever gonna meet this goal? Implementation get, can get very hard. The third step is optimizing. You need the data as feedback to see what's working. You need the place and time to have the people who make decisions look at the data, interpret it, and you need to decide on the next best actions. As an academic, I can tell you, and I know that there are probably economists and engineers in this room, we're very good at data. We are not very good at real-time data. <laughs> we're not very good at actionable, getting the data to the people that need it in the time that they need it. Impact management more than anything is being proactive about the processes and systems you put in place to make sure that people get the data when they need it and then they can act on it. You're turning data into decisions and actions. The last thing is you wanna reinforce your impact. This means documenting your learning so people up and down the organization can see it happening. It means issuing public reports that talk about not just what went well, but what went wrong and why and what you can learn from it. It's also about bringing your internal systems into alignment so that an investor is not compensated solely for their financial returns anymore, but also for achieving higher education scores or better water use or better jobs preparation. I firmly believe that to unlock the sustainable development goals we've already agreed on, we also need this fuel. We need to adopt as fast as possible these practices across many different vehicles and organizations of impact. That's why I was part of the G7 task force and I joined the US National Advisory Board on Impact Investment in 2014. It's why I worked, and I'm so pleased to have worked, with the UN DP SDG impact team in 2020 to create our course on impact measurement in Coursera to reach as many people around the world as fast as possible. And it's why I'm here in Turkey, a country that has deep understanding of the lasting social and environmental impacts of natural disasters, and perhaps sees more clearly than others the urgent potential to change the way business, nonprofits, and government address these issues. I uh, look forward to going deeper into all of this with you throughout the day, sharing the examples and techniques that I've learned, um, both in the conversation coming up and in the workshop, and I'm just very excited to learn from you about how Turkey is charting its own course to these solutions. Last, if I were to leave you with one piece of advice about impact management, it would be just start. Impact management is a set of practices, but even more, it's a mindset change. You change your mindset from complacent witness to detective and active agent. What can we change today, tomorrow, next month, next year? What have we learned? What can we do better? 
and you always keep the ultimate stakeholder in mind, which means you have to take time to check in with them. How are our actions impacting the person actually experiencing this change? The pace of change required to move our global economy, economy from one that consumes and uses up our precious national resources and leaves people behind to one that protects and serves people and planet better is unprecedented. But we have the roadmap, we have the vehicles, we have the fuel, it's time to get on the road. It's time to act. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Clark, for your uh, instructive and enlightening speech. We look forward to hearing more from you on the stage.